In this lecture, we're going to cover the independent samples t-test, which is from the broader family of the t-test. So first we'll start with an overview of what an independent samples t-test actually is, then we'll follow up with the statistical assumptions that need to be met in order to run an independent samples t-test, and then we'll describe the statistical significance used to assess an independent, uh, independent samples t-test and the associated t-value, and then finish up talking about effect size and practical significance in the context of an independent samples t-test. So let's start with that overview first. So an independent samples t-test is just one way that we can describe the association between two variables. And the type of statistical test that we use to describe the association between two variables will depend on the measurement scales of the involved variables. So if we have two nominal or categorical variables, for instance, we can use a chi-square test of independence as an example. Or if we have a nominal and categorical predictor variable and an interval or ratio or continuous outcome variable, we can use an independent samples t-test or we could also use a one-way analysis of variance or even a regression model as well. So we're going to focus on an independent samples t-test today because we are going to be focusing on a test of whether or not we do see an association between a nominal or categorical predictor variable with two levels and an interval or ratio or continuous outcome variable. So what is an independent samples t-test? Well, an independent samples t-test is designed to compare two means, so just two means, from independent groups for some continuous outcome variable. Now, this analysis is sometimes referred to as a between subjects t-test, and you'll see why in just a second. So when we're talking about independent samples, we're talking about two independent groups of people in, in the case that we're talking about human beings. So one group, has unique people, and the other group has unique people. There's no one that's in both groups. OK, so what are the statistical assumptions underlying an independent samples t-test? Well, there are really two major ones when it comes to independent samples t-test. The first is that the outcome variable has a univariate normal distribution in each of the two underlying populations. And these two populations correspond to the two groups of interest. Or in other words, the levels or the categories of the nominal predictor variable or the categorical predictor variable. The second assumption is that the variances of the outcome variable are equal across the two populations, or in other words, the two groups of interest. So let's talk about that first assumption that needs to be met before we can feel confident that we can actually run an independent samples t-test, and that is the assumption of univariate normal distribution. So the outcome variable should show a univariate normal distribution for each level or group of the predictor variable. Okay? So there's going to be two levels to that predictor variable, or two categories, and in each category, the outcome variable should be normally distributed. So let's look at this example here. A histogram is a great way to visualize a normal distribution. And here we can see that the outcome variable for, let's say, group one, and there's two groups, there's also a group two, let's say, we can see the frequency of scores here. It looks like a relatively normal or a univariate normal distribution for that variable. So we might say that this assumption appears to be met here. We would also want to do the same thing for group two and look at the outcome variable and how it's distributed for that group. And if both seem to have univariate normal distributions for both groups for that particular outcome variable, then we would conclude that we've probably met that assumption of univariate normal distribution. The next assumption has to do with the assumption of equal variances. And so what this is, is it's that the variance of the outcome variable should be equal between each level or group of the predictor variable. So you can imagine that we have two distributions here, and each one of these distributions you see in this visual correspond to each one of the groups. So let's say we have group one that's independent from group two, okay? And so if we talk about the dispersion around the mean for these two groups, as represented by those two dotted red arrows, we can start getting an idea of what the actual variances are in terms of variability around those two means. And so here we can see that those two distributions have about the same thickness, or about the same level of variance, and if you were to take the square root of that, standard deviation. So within some degree of error or some degree of similarity, we do see that the variances seem to be relatively equal. And there are tests like Levine's test that we can use to test this assumption statistically. Now here's an example of two distributions for two groups respectively, and we see here that you can eyeball it that this doesn't appear to be equal variances. Instead, we would probably conclude that these are unequal variances, especially if we were using something like Levine's test that indicated that, in fact, we can't treat these two variances as being equal. Okay? So these are some of the assumptions underlying an independent samples t-test. So now let's move on talking about statistical significance in the context of an independent samples t-test. 
So using null hypothesis significance testing, we interpret a p-value that is less than 0.05 to meet the standard for statistical significance, meaning that we reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal or have a difference of zero if we do find that the p-value that's associated with the t-value is less than 0.05. Now if that p-value, which is associated with the t-value, is equal to or greater than 0.05, or whatever type of alpha level we set, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis that the means are equal, or in other words, that they have a difference of zero. And so what this means is that if we think about the first example of the p-value being less than that cutoff of 0.05, that would indicate that, well, in fact, we can conclude that there are differences in between these two means, or there is a difference between these two means. And so we can also use a confidence interval, and if we're setting that alpha level for the p-value at 0.05, we would use a 95% confidence interval. And if the 95% confidence interval for the difference in the means does not include zero, which is the null hypothesis value in this instance, then we would conclude that there is statistical significance, or in other words, that those two means are statistically significantly different from one another. So let's walk through an example to hopefully bring this to life some more. So we're hopefully all pretty familiar with the idea that in human resource management, training evaluation is important. That is, that we want to evaluate whether or not a training actually improved the outcomes that it's supposed to improve. We can use an independent samples t-test to determine whether there are differences between the mean or the average post-training test scores for two training conditions. So let's imagine this scenario. We have a sample of employees, and let's just say this is a true experiment, and we randomly assign those employees to either being in the new training group or the old training group. And we'll say that this is a post-test only with control group design because we don't do a pre-assessment for them. Instead, they go through the training, either it's the new training or the old training, depending on what group they're in, and then they ta everybody takes the post-test that's supposed to assess them on some outcome that was supposed to be improved based on the new training. Now, what's important to remember here is that these are independent groups of people that went to the new training versus the old training. No one did both the new training and the old training if this is truly an independent design here. So instead, we randomly assign half the people to the new training group and the other half go to the old training group. Okay, so there's independence there. And again, we assess everybody afterwards on that post-test. So we can think of this, the, we can think of the group like a control group, this old training group. You can think of this as a control group or a comparison group in this context. And you can think of the new training group as like the treatment group if you're thinking of this in more clinical terms here. Okay, so again, the people assigned to the old training, they're essentially our control. We wanna know whether or not people in the new training program did significantly better on their post-test compared to people from the old training group that we're using as a reference point. So to bring this to life in terms of measurement scale, you can think of the new training versus the old training. Well, this is really our nominal predictor variable here. So this is the nominal predictor is our training condition. Did you get the new training or the old training? And again, this is independent samples designer between subjects, meaning that half the people are in one condition and the other half are in the other condition. No one did both here. Now, the outcome variable is that post-test that everybody took as well. And so this is the interval this is going to be a relatively continuous measure if we're going to use an independent samples t-test, meaning that the measurement scale is interval or ratio in nature. So what we're really interested in is comparing the means on the post-test scores between the mean for those people on the post-test scores that completed the new training versus the mean on the post-test for those people that completed the old training program. And is there a statistically significant difference between those two means? And then how large of a difference are we actually talking about in practical terms? So you can imagine this in terms of distributions as well. We're talking about comparing these two means. So here we have two distributions. And we would assume that they've met all the assumptions of that these are norm, uh, univariate normal distributions within each group here or within each condition, as well as the assumption of equal variances that we talked about earlier. And so here we can see that um, we have old training group mean scores on the post-test and the new training group means on the uh, mean scores on the post test and we can see the variability around those means where the mean is represented by the red line. So the question becomes is there a statistically significant difference between these two means? That's really what we're assessing with an independent samples t-test. So let's think about this in the context of a null hypothesis significance te testing. So remember we're actually testing whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis 
which assumes that both means are the same. So the null hypothesis here would be that the two means are equal, or that the difference between the two means is zero. So we're going to see whether we reject or fail to reject that null hypothesis based on the p-value that corresponds to our t-value for the t-test. Okay, so if there is no appreciable difference between the two means, as indicated by the p-value, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that we would conclude that there's no statistically significant difference between means between the two groups. Now, if the difference we observe between the two means is large enough and the variances are small enough, and we see a p-value that is, let's say, less than 0.05, which is our alpha level that we set, we would then reject the null hypothesis that the mean of the, uh, the difference between the means is zero. In other words, we conclude that the, there's that, in fact, greater than zero differences between these two means, meaning we can treat these two means as being different from one another. So let's look at this a little bit differently here. So here we have this plot here. We have on the x-axis, pre-test, which we didn't give here, and, on, um, and we also have post-test, which is where we actually assess people on that training outcome here. On the y-axis, we have level of the training outcome, okay? And so here we can see with the blue triangle, we have the new training group, and the red circle, we have the old training group here, which again is kind of our reference group, our control group, or comparison group, however you want to call it. And we can see here that there, at least ostensibly, there seems to be a difference on post-test scores between the new training group and the old training group, where the new training group has higher scores. And so the question, though, is, is this a statistically significant difference? And that's where statistical significance test comes in, and we use the p-values um, that are associated with our t-value in order to conclude whether or not there's statistical significance or evidence of it. So let's move on now. Let's assume that we found statistically significant difference between the two means. Let's say that the, the new training group people perform significantly better on that post-test than the people in the old training group, which lends evidence to the fact that, hey, it looks like, at least to some extent, that this new training program is beneficial. Well, let's now talk about how beneficial that new training group actually is. And this is where uh, effect size and practical significance come into play. So a t-value by itself is not directly interpretable in terms of magnitude. You can't compare t-values readily between two different samples or between um, different, um, different studies to determine which one is larger than the other. We really need to compute what's called Cohen's d, or the standardized mean difference, which itself is an effect size. And we use this to compare the magnitude of differences in means to other differences in means. And so this way we can really have a benchmark and everything's on the same scale or within the same metric. And so an effect size is an index of the quantitative relationship between variables. And again, this is good for comparing across studies or across samples. Now, Cohen offered some very general rules of, of thumb when it comes to categorizing and describing effect size qualitative, qualitatively when you're working with Cohen's D or that standardized mean difference. So essentially what Cohen's D is doing is it's looking at the difference between the means and standard deviation units. And so here we see Cohen's rule of thumb. And again, these are not going to be hard set rules. In fact, you'll want to consider the context in your organization and what's going to be meaningful in your organization and in that specific context. So a small, according to Cohen, would be around a Cohen's D of 0.2. A medium would be a Cohen's D of about 0.5. And a large would be a Cohen's D of about 0.8. Now, you'd also, again, think very carefully about the context because imagine a situation where maybe it's a safety training where the outcome of interest is injuries and you find that the new training program is significantly better than the old training program in terms of reducing industries and maybe even deaths as well. Well, then it might be you might want to adjust these downward, whatever rules of thumb you're working with, because then you might actually consider a point two to be large in that context. And the reason being is that preventing people from getting injured, even if it's just, if this training prevents one out of a thousand people from getting really hurt on the job, that might be a really large effect in your mind. So this really depends on practically what is meaningful for you and your organization and the context at hand. But if nothing else, Cohen offers these three, these three qualitative descriptors of small being 0.2, medium being 0.5, and large being around 0.8 that we can use. So to sum up what we talked about on this lecture in, on independent samples t-test, 
First, we started with an overview of what is an independent samples t-test as a way to understand the association between two variables, specifically between a nominal or categorical predictor variable and an interval or ratio or relatively continuous outcome variable. We then went on to describe the two assumptions underlying an independent samples t-test, or in other words, what assumptions need to be met in order to run an independent samples t-test. Then we moved on and talked about what is statistical significance in the context of an independent samples t-test and walked through an example. And we finished up just now talking about why is effect size and practical significance important to consider when we have a finding that is statistically significant in the context of an independent samples t-test. So that wraps up the lecture on independent samples t-test.